recording. Okay, we are ready. So hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of God is Real, God is Good. This week is Kylie, and I have with me LaToya. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good. So um, I have not actually met LaToya, even though we do go to the same school, Andrews University, but I saw her sharing part of her testimony um, on another platform. And so I reached out to her and said that I loved it and would love to have her share. And so that's why she's here with us this week. So let's start with a prayer real quick. Sure. Um, dear Lord, please be with LaToya and I as we do this interview. Um, and so, and as she tells her stories about how you've worked in her life, please just let her to th share things that will bring glory to your name and that will be an inspiration to others and will help them on their journeys. And um, be with me too as I do this. And amen. Amen. Okay, LaToya, why don't you tell everybody where you're from? So I am from a very cool place. I am from an island. Uh, and uh, it's an island called St. Lucia. That's in the Caribbean. Oh, you're from St. Lucia? I am. Oh my goodness. I went to school at Eastern Washington University and my best friend there, um, her name is Petal and she is from St. Lucia. Oh, very nice. Look at that. I know. Oh, I didn't even know that about you. So, you know, it's great people come from there. <laughs> I and, do know um, this. <laughs> and uh, I, um, I just, I love my island. I try to go as often as I can, but, um, you know, I was, I was born and raised there and that was my first introduction to the Seventh-day Adventist church. My mom was a uh, Catholic teen who, um, uh, my family is very de devout Catholics and mm -hmm. Um, we have an academy, a Seventh-day Adventist academy on the island. And so uh, my grandmother decided to send my mom to that school. And that, that's how she was introduced okay. to the faith. And so her best friends um, kind of scooped her in. And uh, so she decided to get baptized. Um, I guess in uh, 18, 19, around, around there. Um, but before she, before the day she found out she was pregnant. Oh, wow. And so, you know, of course, the amount of thoughts that would have gone through her mind. And uh, so she went to her pastor or the, the pastor to be <laughs> at the church. And, um, you know, I feel like God saved me twice because we know in the Catholic church, their, their stance on abortion per se, or life, you know, and then our church's stance on life, and so I feel like I was kind of saved twice there, so um, when the pastor talked to her, I, I could never forget her story, she says, he asked her, well, doesn't God love the baby too, Oh. and they actually baptized her pregnant with me, Oh. She was a, she was a single mom. She wasn't married. Again, she was a teenager, and um, you know, sometimes in church we find that's very rare. Uh, we find a lot of the opposite happening, unfortunately, mm -hmm. which is part of the whole kind of abuse umbrella that you know I love to advocate for on how we treat people when we quote unquote think they're fallen, and especially a lot of teen girls where would be ostracized or disfellowshipped if they're pregnant instead of wrapping, you know, our arms around them and, and trying to save both of them, you know, yeah. her and the baby. And sometimes we see the guy gets kind of like scotch-free. He just yeah. gets off and, you know, nothing. So anyway, he was, he baptized her with me in that church and that church, once I was born, scooped me up and I became their child. Oh. And so, any memory I have of my church was always village, fellowship, love, and the side of Jesus that we would hope everybody sees, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I grew up, grew up in the church, loved it. It was very, very much involved. We're, we're artists also, my mom sang. And so we all sing and play instruments and so forth. Pathfinders was my, you know, my fun place to go because we had a lot of Pathfinder meetings on the beach, which is my favorite place. And so, <laughs> you know, so it was just a really, really fun time uh, growing up and just, just knowing this faith to be, um, as a child, pure and 
just joyful, not knowing the things that as adults we get to learn of, you know? And so um, I remember wanting to get baptized, you know, at the time, you know, we had a crusade and I just felt this urge that I, I wanted to get baptized and my mother felt I was too young. Mm. And, and do you I, remember how old you were? I think I may have been about eight, eight oh. or nine. And in my mind, I was grown, you know? Yep. So, <laughs> so I remember I wanted to get baptized and she was like, no, you're too young. And I'm saying, but I'm a pathfinder, you know, so <laughs> we do all this stuff. And I kept every, every night for altar call, I kept going up. So it was like this little girl keeps going up every night and everybody's looking like, what is going on? And I'm crying and everything. And I just felt this pull, you know, I feel like, like Jesus was hugging me. I just felt this pull and he was dragging me up to the altar every night. And so I went to the pastor and he went to my mom and my mom said, no, she's too young. So I lived at the base of a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I remember climbing up the mountain, they had blown off the top and put my high school on top there and so but it was a steep climb mm -hmm. so I remember climbing to that first landing and overlooking the part of my uh town you could see as far as your eyes could see and I remember looking out there and saying to God if you can here's a deal if you can please make her make me get baptized then my life is yours it was just that simple. It's like, I'm yours. And for listeners out there, be careful what you bargain with God about because he does, he does take, take it, you know, he does take promises. And, and, um, and I was like, you can do whatever you want to do with me. I'm yours. Just want to get baptized. Oh, so that's I, so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I did end up getting baptized and um, I had in this, pure young mind of mine, this perfect world, you know, my sweet Jesus and I were just gonna skip together into eternity because I got married to him, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't long after that. It wasn't long after that, um, that I ended up being sexually abused mm. by a family member. Um, I mean, a, a friend of the family, not a family member. Um, by extension, you know, you have those people that we call families. Yeah. Family. And so it was like an uncle, quote mm -hmm. unquote, one of them kinds. And I remember um, that happening soon afterwards and just shattered my world. And so the questions had begun. Why? Why would God allow that? Wait a minute. We just got married, per se, you know, and we just... I just got baptized. I made a deal with you. You literally, I told you, like, my life is yours to do whatever you want to do with it. And as far as I know with the Bible, you take care of your children. So how, when I just make the biggest commitment of my life, I went through all of this drama with my mom and you allow this to happen. Mm. So those questions had started and my trust in him began to, it wasn't, it was just weird, you know? And um, it was soon after that, then another tragedy hit. My parents split. Mm. Um, my stepdad, I, I'm adopted also. So that's another fun fact. And um, my two dads, my biological father and my adopted dad, um, were very good co-parents. And so I always had both of them in my life. And But my, my adopted dad and my mom had some real struggles that led to a lot of domestic turmoil, mm -hmm. you know, in the house. And my mom fled with um, my siblings to the United States. Uh, she left me on the island with my grandmother and then later on sent for me so that I can help take care of my sister. Um, so that added a different component now where here is a woman who has gone through quite a bit um, emotionally, mentally, and, um, possibly had a breakdown and the only thing she could do to take herself out of that situation was flee to another country and um, so we came here and didn't know much about immigration or anything like that and she stayed she overstayed and so when she sent for me she just said to me um, you just you won't be able to go back home 
Mm. And I was a senior in high school. Oh, wow. I was 14, though, because I had started high school at nine. Um, so I was 14. I was a senior in high school, number three in the school. Wow. I was supposed to be a doctor and all that fun stuff. And maybe a couple of weeks after school had started, maybe about a month after school started, they just snatched me and they never saw me again. My friends never saw me again until that was 23 years later. Wow. That's a long time. It's a long time. So we were undocumented all that time. So that those those events kind of laid the foundation for the, the, the breach in trust and also um, that brokenness in in me and the the lack of trust and um, also psychologically and physically it kind of geared and it set the foundation for me to be a mess <laughs> teenager so you know once the hormones kicked in and the feelings that I had got from this man doing all this stuff to me um, which as children we don't know the difference meaning we know it shouldn't be happening but we can't kind of gauge it because abuse doesn't always feel bad mm -hmm. um, it's there's a difference with the the hitting versus the fondling and stuff like that that does wake up these things that God have put inside of us so it's like kind of like a confusing state like he shouldn't be doing this but it does you know it doesn't feel bad so then your whole way of thinking and perceiving what's good and what's not good and identifying the different is is skewed from that point so I really didn't have a clear idea or even the boundary set for me mm -hmm. on how to identify how to say no how to stop my voice was taken away and um so eventually I ended up really doing a mess with my body with guys and trying to stop these urges and you know oh but for God's grace my gosh let me tell you Kylie, I should have been pregnant a million times, all kinds of diseases. I should have had AIDS. I could have been killed because a lot of these men I didn't know. Mm. And it was just this dragon in me to try to kill this urge. And and I, I didn't know that all along God was keeping his promises. Mm. He, he was keeping that part of the bargain to take care of me. Um, and so that led to, to me and turn into a relationship with uh, my kid's dad. And that foundation wasn't the, the right foundation. And I take full responsibility on, you know, for my part of it. But when you are in this state of just promiscuity, for me, I did not want to do it. I was still in church singing every week on a praise team. You know, I still love Jesus. Like he was my everything, but I could not stop that side of, I was like, a night and day person because mm -hmm. and you were hurt inside and you're just trying to like find a way to handle soothe. yeah you you self-soothe you try to numb the pain but you know and so there, every night I would go to bed crying because it was like I love you but I don't I don't know how to stop and just crying for help and so anyway we got married and um, most of it was because we were sexually um active outside of marriage and um the church was like hey you, you can't do that uh you guys are living together and so get married that is not the reason to get married <laughs> <laughs> no that's not a good reason uh. <laughs> to get married and that should not be the advice given to a young couple either mm. um, and i think some pastors do the best that they can but we really have to be careful with um the ultimatums that we give people that is that does not align with god's principle nor um nor if it if it doesn't align with his pur purpose because marriage is is for purpose mm -hmm. and so you allow people to go into that institute for the reasons that are not a good foundational um that are not foundationally sound and you set them up absolutely set them up and so we were doomed from the beginning now god can do anything you know mm -hmm. what I mean? but when you have broken people who have not done the deep work of healing and setting that rewiring their mind and setting it straight to exactly what God needs. 
we're destined to perceive things wrong, make poor decisions and just start down a, a snowball. Mm -hmm. And so he was broken, I was broken and um, it just started off wrong. It started off with um, him letting me know and very clearly that his family, his, his immediate family came first, not me. Mm. And um, that was made clear from the beginning, even yeah. before we had gotten married. Mm. Um, and that's not the way God designed it. He says man and woman uh, should be one. And, and cleave and all of that. Yeah. And, and there were messages that were given to me and, and repeated from the beginning. And there were times when he was very clear uh, in letting me know or reminding me, look, your family doesn't want you. Your mother mm. doesn't want you. No one wants you. I'm the only one who's going to even put up with you. So, you know, just get your behind back in the house. I, you know, I try to leave one time and, and he was very clear. Um, you're not wanted. Mm -hmm. You're not wanted. I will be the one to put up with you. And so. Um, and that's so sad. Like, that's like the lie Satan tells us too, because God says you are wanted. You are worthy. Exactly. You are mine. And yeah. So those feelings of abandonment had begun already from since leaving the island, mm -hmm. mom leaving, um, the abuse as a child. So those things were, you know, the demonic forces, they, they can't read our minds. We know that, but they do see the events that are happening in our lives. And they're able to, to create a narrative around that and use people or agents to, to drive those negative messages um, home. And if we are not strong, uh, spiritually strong, we believe them. Mm -hmm. and, and no one should feel guilty about that because it is a setup, right? It is. <laughs> um, it is a setup. So it's not anything that you have done wrong. It is that you have been conditioned from, from sometimes gener from generations mm -hmm. set up to take down the women in your family, the men in your family, you know, we've been set up. And so I didn't know that either. I can say that now because I know better, but listening to those things and looking at the facts and saying, oh, yeah, he's right. And not understanding there's a difference between facts and truth. Mm. Facts were that these things were happening in my family circle. These things did happen. The truth was that my family did love me and they did want me, um, but I didn't know the difference between facts and truth. And so he presented the facts to me and I believed them because they were existent. Um, and so that just began a lot of the verbal, emotional, and religious um, abuse. And um, I tell the women that I deal with all the time, no one has to hit you for it to be abuse. Mm -hmm. There is contact abuse and there's non-contact abuse. And, and sometimes the words hit just as hard as a fist. Mm -hmm. So do not negate that if it, if it's, killing you if it's hitting you and your spirit to, to tear you down it is not okay and he doesn't have to hit for it to be bad um words matter they surely matter just as god spoke and it mattered when we speak it matters there's there's life and death in there and so we can abuse someone and literally kill them with our words maybe slower than a fist or a gun or a knife but they do kill um, and, and so all of that was happening and, you know, being undocumented. So you see how the setup is here. Yeah. Undocumented. I am estranged from my mother. I am in the United States, um, without family, you know, in, close by, I have my mother and my sister, but my uncle lives in New York. Um, the only thing I had was my church family. Mm -hmm. And, and then this man who I am now bonded to. A life I believed because mm -hmm. we're taught one and done. Yep. Okay. That's it. No matter what's going on, you're going to have to stay in there. And if the only way you coming out is you dying in a body bag, then that's the way you will get out of the marriage. And so I thought, wow, God, really? I mean, it was just a baptism. That's all I wanted. This, this is the deal. This is, oh what you did to me in the name of your son come on mm. um 
but yet there was something inside of me that wouldn't let me leave the church, the faith. I, I loved it. I knew it had saved me twice already. And so I think his spirit was really strong in me, kind of holding those breaches up, um, ensuring that I didn't hit rock bottom um, and or below rock bottom. <laughs> rock bottom. Um, and, and so, it, you know, there was one time I went to prayer meeting and uh, they were asking for prayer requests. And I, 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 my prayer request was, oh, my marriage is in trouble. I need help. And one of our, God bless her soul. <laughs> she kind of pulled me down and she said, uh, oh, you don't talk about this stuff here. What are you talking about? You don't talk about this stuff here. And I said, but this is prayer meeting. And they asked for prayer requests. And she said, go home and give your husband sex. It's something that you were doing wrong. Don't oh, come wow. here and talk about this stuff. Oh, wow. And I feel that that was the third round of silence in me. So I was silenced when the man abused me mm -hmm. because he said, you know, if you tell your family, I'll tell them you're a nasty girl and you wanted it. And this is a grown man with oh, a wow. nine, 10 year old. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I believed the fact that he had the ability to tell my family that. Yeah. So, so he silenced me. Um, I was silenced when I came up here and knowing I couldn't go back home. So I couldn't cry about it. I couldn't complain about it. I just had to suck it up. And this is your new home. I was also silenced when my spouse said to me, where are you going? Mm -hmm. Just just get your behind inside. And you cannot complain that you are not priority. Mm -hmm. And now the last place that I thought I had as a refuge and safe place is now telling me to be quiet. Mm -hmm. You cannot come here and share. Um, you cannot even ask for prayer. <laughs> yeah. Which is so <laughs> sad because our church, our church is supposed to pray for us. We're supposed to come together and pray. Okay. And like, and like, understandably, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, well, that's not something that we want to talk about. But sometimes we need to talk about the things we don't want to talk about. Yeah. And that's an institution that God gave us from before sin even came in the world. So why is it not that we cannot talk freely about it to help restore and save? It's not mm -hmm. something burst out of evil. This thing was supposed to be perfect and blissful and so forth. That's like, that's such a good point. <laughs> <laughs> like, why not fight for it? You, you yeah. fight fight for you fight for the sabbath so much as our church you know we make it such the big deal which it is it but is. there were two things that were instituted in the garden and and i feel and like we don't want to talk about that, <laughs> talk about that. no that's Girl. that's not appropriate for this group no. we, we you talk you about that at home something right you know go home and handle the business yeah so i felt i was silenced then too because now where do i go so um i just suffered in silence for years. And I learned how to mask. I learned the art of having split lives. I learned how to smile and have you believe the smile. I learned how to paint pictures of a perfect home, a perfect wife, a perfect husband, perfect relationship. We dress the part. We dress great. My kids are beautiful, they're well behaved, you know, we have a home. And even though the, we don't have the documentation, God was still taking care of us, you know, and so years go by, and this, this perfection became the norm. So when I ended up at the place where I had already had three nervous breakdowns, mm. And God took me from those miraculously. I can't tell. I'm supposed to be in a nut house right now. <laughs> um, I, I've had many suicide thoughts and attempts, you know, and he saved me from those. Um, it just was at the point where I was like, you know what? I'm going to take my chances. Um, but I have a choice. I have three children. So do I want them to have a mother that they will be visiting in a nut house? Or do I take the opportunity or a chance to get freedom so that I can be the mother they need? Mm -hmm. Either way, 
I may lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're looking at divorce and all of that brings to the family and children. And I'm looking at maybe my church excommunicating me because of the divorce, mm -hmm. or I'm looking at being excommunicated anyway in my mind, if I mm -hmm. lose my mind, <laughs> and then what? So um, I went into a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer. And um, I literally said to God, you know, I don't think that this is the plan that you have for marriage. I think your name is being mocked. Mm. I think we're making it, we're, we're shaming you. I think we're lying in your name. We are lying. We are painting a picture that eventually when people find out the truth, they're going to know we're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. So I'll take my chances. I know you with me. I know I trust you. Somehow I still believe that you will care for me. Um, we ended up having some really serious issues. I ended up stepping out on the marriage um, after all of the stuff had gone down. We were separated physically and emotionally and everything. And um, once that kind of hit the fan, it it then became, I was, ex I was um, cut off from my church in a sense where everybody was like, oh, you're such the evil person. And I'm saying, wait a minute. I've been telling you guys for years, since I was 20 years old, that we've been in trouble. And now I'm in my 30s and this hits the fan and all of a sudden it's bad. I'm like, I've been crying out to you guys for help. And um, it killed me because um, I knew that I didn't do it on purpose, mm -hmm. but um, I just felt like I had disappointed Jesus. And I was like, well, nobody will miss me anyway. So I'll just take my life. And the Lord prevented that. Um, I think the years following that were probably one of the hardest set of years I've ever experienced because I clearly heard the Spirit say, don't leave the faith. But I am in a congregation that has lost regard for me, mm. that has placed me in a label as this whore-ish person um, who has taken sides, which a lot of times happens when there's a, a split, they take a side. Most of the time they take the side of the man and the woman is left to dry. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm dealing with that. And yet I hear God say to me, don't leave. So you tell me, Jesus, how am I supposed to be happy and joyful every Sabbath when every Sabbath I have to walk in there with the looks and the snarls and everything and being reminded that I'm not good enough? Mm -hmm that I am rejected, I am abandoned. I have a close cluster of friends who still speak to me, but all of a sudden I can't serve. Mm. And so the one thing that I had that was connected me with you is taken away. My kids are hearing stuff from church school. You know, their friends are telling them what's discussed on Sabbath lunch tables about their mom and dad. And and I am, I am here um, still I'm a media person, so I'm still running the media department and listening to these, these people speak about Jesus and they don't want me. Mm. So my question to him was, I want you to know, I want you to tell me how I'm supposed to do that. So Sabbath hours became the worst for me. I was fine Monday through Thursday. Once Friday came, I was a wreck crying and because I knew the next 24 hours were going to be the worst and it was every week and um, it was hard Kylie it was really hard I would sit at church sometimes and just weep and say God I don't understand when are you going to give me a release my friends used to say to me why would you stay in this church because they would treat you so bad and this is this and why and I said because God told me not to leave mm. I can't yeah that's hard yeah. So um, it was a couple of years of staying in that. Um, but I do remember that he used to give me a lot of dreams, a lot of dreams. And I remember the, the Lord's, uh, the shepherd saw him became my best friend. So, um, and just saying, you are my shepherd. You are my shepherd. Um, in the real world, quote unquote, real world. <laughs> Things were working out, um, the court system and all of that were 
on our side per se. Mm-hmm. They were making the decisions to make sure I was taken care of and the kids were taken care of. Um, so I, so weird. I, you're gonna freak out at this, right? So <laughs> I was listening to the radio one day, and there's a a, a Christian radio station, mm-hmm. right? And there was this lady on there and she was prophesying. And she's like, there's, there's, a, there's a woman and she starts going down the list. And I was like, wait a minute, what crazy stuff is this? She's like, you're in trouble. You, um, you, you feel abandoned. You just separated. I mean, she was describing oh, wow. me and I mean, chills. Oh my goodness. Like, to get on the bus and come down to the radio station right now. God has something for you. And, you know, I'm sitting here like, okay this is crazy yeah <laughs> it's so strong and I was like golly do I do this like talk about crazy faith right yeah you hear someone on the radio telling you come down you know in your heart it's you they're talking about well I got on the bus <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> and I went down to the station. I had never been there. So I, I went to the radio station and she was still on the air. Wow. While, when I walked in and when I walked in, uh, she saw me and she said, uh, she closed the program. She said, she is here. <gasps> and wow. We next week. Wow. I came off the air and I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like now what? <laughs> and she just said to me, God got God has got your back. Oh, you're going to be just fine. Mm. God has heard your prayers. He has heard your cries, and He has not left you. You are going to be just fine. And she said, and you are going to be a mouthpiece for Him. And you have no idea where the places He will take you. Now, granted, I'm still a Praise doctor. God. You know? Yeah. And, um, she was um, Pentecostal, I believe. And so the general manager of the radio station, he's like, well, who are you? <laughs> and I told him and he's like, okay. And somehow the Lord put in the hearts of these two men, a passion for me or compassion for me. And um, they said, well, are you working? I said, no, I can't work. Now I had, we had just left mm-hmm. the house and I was living at my mother's house. We were all living in one room. With my wow. son, three children in my mother's house and so I had no money I had nothing remember I can't work and I had been a housewife all this time so he said to me okay um you come down here five days a week and I'll teach you everything that we know about uh great Christian radio wow and for a few weeks uh these two men the general manager and the um the, the VP, the other manager, took from their paycheck to give me $100 every wow. week. And they trained me in everything, editing, producing, whatever whatever I needed to know. They took me under their wing. These two men, he, one is a Rastafarian, okay, who's not a Christian, but uh-huh. he's believes in God. And the other one was a Baptist, right? Mm-hmm. And the radio station had all all Christian dome, so it was it was any faith you had, people will come there and broadcast their shows, and so it's like God took me from a dry and barren. I felt like Hagar, you know, mm-hmm. he from this desert, and He placed me in this like bubble, which broadcasted His word twenty four seven. Wow, and so. That's what replenished me. That's what built me up. And while I'm producing the shows, I have to listen to the messages. Yeah. So, and I'm listening to the music and I'm putting in the next program. And sometimes I'm setting up the next bishop who comes in and I have to stay in the studio with him to run his board. And so the word was being infused in me every day, five Mm -hmm. days when I went in there. And you talk about setup, you talk about, you know, like, I got you. And then one day, the owner of the station, he is, um, he was an ex Navy SEAL, mm-hmm. got into a car accident. Oh. And he owns, he owned, he was in the business in, in the world. And he had said to God in that accident, if you save my life, I'm going to take what I know about radio and do it for you. And he was saved. So wow. he took all his money and he moved to Connecticut, 
bought a tower and established this radio station. That's cool. One day he was, um, he came in and he met me and um, the guy said to him, you know, my situation. And he said, okay, keep her, you know, keep her on a volunteer basis. And then I remember I went to, I had gone to church in another church uh, in another city and praying that Sabbath just forgot to, to come through for me. And I got a call after that church service that he went for a run and he had some stroke or heart attack or something, fell and died. Oh. But the last thing he had done that Friday, which I had not known about, was go to the station and told them to hire me. Wow. Praise God. Them to hire me. They got it together and he died the next day. Wow. And they honored his word and they put me on payroll because I had like a tax ID number so I can still, I could get paid and pay taxes. Mm, okay. Um, and there's like backstory with that. But um, then I was hired. And so here it is now, I am officially at this radio station and this is where the Lord took care of me and miracles upon miracles upon miracles. And granted, I'm still going to church, our Adventist church, but that not that was not my church mm -hmm. anymore, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I went there, I did what I needed to do, but my fellowship, What's with my these? sustenance, my, my feeding became the Baptist bishops, the Pentecostal bishops. So God trained me and was teaching my mind to think outside of what I thought. All I knew was Adventism. Mm -hmm. but he was saying to me, I have my people everywhere. That's so true. And we'll do what they need to do to care for you. Mm. So, um, yeah, so eventually, you know, we got divorced, but what you had heard about when I was speaking was, I think this in, innate desire in me to continue the legacy of what got started mm -hmm. in me. If, if we're outside of the safety of the fold, we are exposed to the enemy to do much more worse with us than if we stayed on the ship, right? Mm -hmm. the and I believe that that was a lesson he was trying to teach me that this hedge of protection that he had given me in the form of the faith mm -hmm. was more than just a building. It was more of a covenant. Mm. It was, you know, when he says the angel of the Lord encamp encamp encampus around us, right? Yeah. When, when Satan went to God and say about Job, you got this hedge around him, I can't touch him. You know, I can't, I can't do anything because, because that's your property. And being here at seminary, I've learned more about that, that when we give our life to him, it's like he puts markers, boundary markers, or, uh, you know, land markers around us. We are his property. So mm -hmm. if any enemy comes in our lives, they're trespassing. And what do we do when someone trespasses on our property? We handle that business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that day when I asked him to do whatever he wants to do with me, in a sense, I was saying, here are the rights to me, mm -hmm. right? Yes. I am your property. And I believe that day, or even from before I was born, I should say, he put a marker around me that I was his. And anything that happened, um, Satan would have to come to him like he came to Job mm. and even give that argument. Like, I can't touch her because you have this, you have this protection around her. I can't touch her. And it, it was a hard, long journey to, to understand that. And it comes with spiritual maturity and it comes with digging in the word and it comes with forgiveness. And it comes to, from really seeing Jesus as not our enemy as mm -hmm. not the one who abuses us, as not the one who does that, but the one who buffers and protects and takes us back and, and, and deals with those situations so that it works out for our good. He was teaching me commitment. He was teaching me to stay faithful to him so that he could work it out for my good. He was showing my children commitment to stay in the faith, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what, it wasn't about the church. It wasn't about those people. It wasn't about the building. It was about relationship with him. Mm -hmm. He was teaching me true Christianity. So even if I'm stranded on an island or in a, 
rock somewhere and there's no building, I am still in his church. Oh, yes. And I'm still protected. Um, and our church has to learn that, that we have to take the art of building a hedge around God's people and protecting them from abuse, from a domestic violence, of being a safe space. You have safe shelters that are built up by cities and towns so that men, women, children who are in danger can run to and they have confidentiality protection. They are hidden, they are cared for, they are protected from their abusers. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we're not the same? <laughs> Why a woman run into our doors and know that we will not turn her over to the one who's trying to kill her? It, it's like it's reversed. Mm. The, the world is doing it and we're like literally pushing them out. Yeah. Out there. It made no sense to me. But, but knowing that this is what God wants to do, I decided that um, I had to forgive him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to forgive myself. And then I had to be a voice mm. to say, if he did this miraculous thing for me and did this crazy miracle to take care of my family and the kids to save me and to, and to keep some kind of joy of Christ in me, I need to set an example. So I don't speak against my church. I try to partner with my church in order so we can get better, so mm. that we can rewire our thinking of why we're instituted. Why are we here? The gospel is meant to save. And yes, we need to talk about these things. There should be transparency in talking about marriage and abuse and sex and domestic violence and all of that a woman should be able to stand up with a group of women or sit with a group of women and the older ones share their stories without judgment and without shame to say this is what i've been through so let me help you get on the other side because i am on the other side that is what we are here for Amen. we are supposed to be the ones where the cities and the states come to us for training on yeah. how to rebuild and restore people, but they're the ones doing it and we're the ones <laughs> to them. <laughs> so that has been my whole my whole thing. And you know, a lot of people have said, why you stayed there and why you were not upset with them? And I'm like, they didn't do it to me. The enemy did it to me. Mm. That's so but, awesome that you were able to see that. Like yes. so often we can't see past the like what we can see, like the physical, and we can't see like this isn't like our neighbor, our church member, or whatever. This is, like you're saying, it's the enemy that's doing this. Yeah, yeah. That's so, so this is where we are. <laughs> that's so cool. And that's so awesome. And, like, that's how I, like, um, you know, came across your stuff was you were speaking about, about how the church, you know, needs to step up for domestic violence and sharing your story. And I think that's so cool. And I'm sure God is going to use you in many wonderful ways. And I'm excited to see how Thank that plays you. out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we, I'm not the only one. That's Believe it. a beautiful thing. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not the only one, and I. I don't ever profess to be. And I. And I feel like that's a special army that he has, mm -hmm. an army of women and men who have come through some of the ho most horrific experiences, meant to destroy the essence of God in them, meant to destroy the se sexuality of God and the sensuality of God in them, mm -hmm. and for us to see marriage through the lens of decay. There is a special group of us who have made it through and whose job is to go back in the fire and pluck the others out. That is our job. And if the fire didn't burn us, it's not going to touch us. We have already proven that we are, we are immune to that if we have been rightly trained and refined by the attacks. You know what I mean? Like we've been forged in the fire and it is our job. What we get when we go through trials, I believe, is a gift to identify others who are going through the same. So, for instance, an alcoholic can spot out another alcoholic mm -hmm. without seeing them drunk. You know what I mean? <laughs> yep. Exactly. So, for us, I can spot out, I can pick out a woman or a child who's gone through some kind of, who is going through or who's gone through. They don't have to say a word. 
there are mm. certain mannerisms, there are certain ways we process, there are certain triggers, I can tell. And so if, if all of us who have been through it and came through it banded together to provide support, and there are people who are doing it, and I'm part of certain groups, there's mm -hmm. some undercover, underground groups even on Facebook oh, that I'm a part of where women awesome. are safe. That's if so cool. I love that thought too, because about, you know, going through the fire, because it's like, I think it's a verse about, you know, like, uh, um, like, you know, the devil meant it for bad, but God used it for good, you know? Yeah. And we can't be selfish with that gift of mm -hmm. overcoming. Why? I can't take the victory and, and hide it away. He says, you know, don't hide your light. It is supposed mm -hmm. to shine. Um, but we have to learn courage. There is mm -hmm. a courage that comes. Brene Brown talks, talks about going into the arena, right? Mm -hmm. She talks about courage and she talks about vulnerability. Well, God is the most vulnerable being I know. Mm -hmm. he, he, he shows us what vulnerability is because he keeps bringing us, he keeps entering into our lives knowing we'll knock him out. <laughs> and, and he'll be in pain, yet he's vulnerable and he feels. So there's no shame in your story at all because mm. your story is a fact. It is not the truth. Oh, the fact is you went through it. And these, these are the details of events. That's mm -hmm. your story. The truth is you never lost your crown. The mm. truth is you never were degraded from a princess and a, a prince of God. The truth is you are always his child. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. The story is, this is the chapter. And so if we can learn that, then we can let go more easily of some of phases and stages in our lives and not hold on to it. To So for instance, you know, you'll tell a child, uh, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid, right? And they believe they are. But the thing is, they may have done something stupid. That doesn't mean they are stupid. Mm -hmm. That's something I had to learn too or unlearn that just because I made mistakes or I made errors in judgment, so I did all this stuff with my body or I stepped out on my marriage does not mean that I am an immoral person or I am lost or I'm wicked or I'm a whore or anything like that. These were decisions that were made, but once they're given over and there's forgiveness involved, I am still a daughter of the King. Amen. And that's the truth. Amen. So, that's so good exactly so that's so good because we all get caught up in that and like I know like my own past like there are sins that I'm like this defines me now now that I have done that that is who I am yeah. and like I'm not quite where you are but I'm getting there you know say like that's that's just that's just a step that I took that's not who I am yeah and it's fleeting it's gone. Mm -hmm. it's gone the most beautiful image that God has ever given to me Jesus has ever given to me is where he says you know though your skins are as scarlet there will be at white as white as snow and you know and he throws it into the depths of the sea and I'm saying to myself it was so hard Kylie for me to accept that because like David says my sins are ever before me and mm. so I'm like well if they're ever before him how are they cast out <laughs> into the depths? Like, that contradicts it, itself but learning that in submission when I give that over to Jesus and help ask him to help me resist the urge to go back what he does is he takes it and then he rebukes the enemy on our behalf mm. and the enemy will keep coming back but we don't rebuke the enemy. I learned that recently from my pastor. I don't have the authority or the power to do that. The Bible never said to rebuke the enemy. Mm. He said resist the enemy. But resist in the original language translates to submit. So I submit to Jesus. I give it to him quickly because I can't handle it. So it's yeah. like, this is too heavy for me. So here. Um, and my urges and my repetitive um behavior right mm -hmm. so here are the things that I keep doing and I'm going to give it to you every time I do it because Ooh. sometimes it's not one and done yeah so every time I do it I'm going to give it to you knowing that you're a safe space and you love me so much you don't make ever make me feel like I'm this worst thing right I'm going to keep giving it to you and I know every time you give it I give it to you you're going to rebuke the devil or the enemy for having the audacity to uh, tempt me with it and at some point 
we get stronger and stronger and stronger and we do it less and less and less and like because we're looking for quick fixes Mm -hmm. and then sometimes that just doesn't happen so we learn to be patient with ourselves and then all of a sudden we realize that well I'm not thinking about that thing as much or maybe I did it twice in the month instead of seven days a week you know <laughs> and then you start rewarding yourself with grace and patience and celebrating yourself and then you realize the quicker you learn to hand it over more quickly there's an art in it where you start releasing even your own personal guilt quicker mm. and quicker and quicker knowing that god has this so enemy you're gonna have to deal with him about mm-hmm. that because mm-hmm. that didn't define who I am. That's just part of me growing and I'm, I'm still not there yet. And so I will still have these urges because there are tendencies in me. It's behavioral patterns, but I don't have to go through it by myself. The minute I hand it over to Jesus, I don't have it anymore. It's gone. It is absolutely gone. So it's about believing Amen. that if I give it to him, he has it. Don't take it back and it's gone. That's the hard, that's the hard part. You're like, it's oh, hard, I gave it to you, but let me just do this though. <laughs> no, it's practice, practice, practice. Mm-hmm. It's not a matter of perfection. He's not asking us for that. He's asking us to, to be habitual with giving him the things. Mm-hmm. Even if we mess up today and I didn't give it to him today, it doesn't mean I can't give it to him tomorrow. It doesn't mean that I've screwed up. It just means today, I didn't, you know, I didn't give it to you today. My bad. I'm sorry. But you know what? Here you go. <laughs> you know, it, It's just learning to practice that and to have the kind of relationship with him where we're not going to him like some doomsday daddy, mm-hmm. where we're so afraid of him mm-hmm. and just go to him. Um, you see kids, right? If you've ever been around kids and you see those babies, when they start, they're so exploratory and they're so just nosy all up in everything mm-hmm. and they'll pick up anything and put it in their mouth. So it's <laughs> literally running behind them to make sure that they don't pick up the cherry that has been on the floor for two days. <laughs> That's what kids do. That's what babies they do. do. <laughs> and we run behind them. And the quickest thing we do is we take it, right? Mm-hmm. We take them, give it to us give it to us, give it to us. Or if they pop it in their mouth, we take our finger and we scoop <laughs> give it to us. What do we do? The minute they give it to us, we throw it away. Mm-hmm. That's that true. is what he does. Mm, yes. Throw it away. And then we, he runs after us again because we picked up something else. <laughs> and he goes, give it to us. If we can do that with a child and not beat them, because what do we say? That's part of the phase they're in. Mm-hmm. That is part of the learning phase they're in. Do you know eventually when the child sees us come in, they do put their hand out? Have you ever seen that? Yes. They're if like, okay. Enough, they're like, I got caught. Here you go. <laughs> I don't want your finger in my mouth, so I'll just give it to you now. <laughs> exactly. Mm. He has given us the human examples of what he does with us. And that child is never afraid of us. They always come back and hug us. And they, they go back and pick it up again. And eventually they'll learn. If mama's coming, let me spit it out. <laughs> That's the joy of it. It's repetition and knowing that we're not going to see it again because that's how kind and protective he is. He throws it away. Amen. That's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, I think we're about at the fun. end of your our time here, but I greatly appreciate what you've shared and I'm sure the listeners will too. So I'm going to end our recording.